that led to the Battle of Marathon happened along this route here through the Aegean Sea. You see this red uh, uh, arrow here. So it, the, the Persians launched their ships from Asia Minor, moved across the Aegean, and then landed first at Eretria here, which they besieged and then took. Eretria was the other city that had helped uh, the, the uh, Greeks revolt in the 490s. But after Eretria then landed just slightly north um, and east of the city of Athens itself, of course, about 25 miles away from Athens, the distance of a modern marathon race. So now the moment has come that the Persians have landed at Marathon with a force of probably hundreds of thousands of men. Um, maybe 80, 100, 150,000 men, many of whom will have been a part of their fleet. They had a fleet of 600 ships, according to Herodotus, 600 warships. Um, and the Athenians have to decide what to do. <laughs> um, the Athenians have an army of probably 10,000 or so men. And uh, there wasn't time to get all the other Greeks involved in uh, defending against the Persians. And the truth is, most of the other Greeks probably weren't that interested in coming to help uh, fight the Persians here. But the Athenians did send a message to Sparta looking for aid. Sparta is about 125 miles away here. I'll talk more about that message. Um, but the Athenians have to decide what to do. And what they decided to do was to march up to Marathon. And this is, I think, one of the most amazing decisions in the history of Greek free government because they were really vastly outnumbered. And by leaving Athens, they were leaving a fortified city to go out and meet the Persians on open, in open territory. They're giving up the advantage of staying behind their walls. And I think the reason for that is that they were afraid that Athens might be betrayed. There were people in Athens who were sympathizing with the Persians. Most ancient cities in antiquity that are besieged are ultimately betrayed by someone. <laughs> if you want to know what happens to a besieged city, it's usually someone inside the city opens the gates up and betrays it. So I think that some Athenians were worried about what would happen if they stayed behind their walls. They decided the best defense was a good offense. And so they took their army to Marathon. They were waiting now for several days in Marathon, almost certainly hoping that the Spartans would show up to help them. Um, the Spartans were delayed by a religious festival. The Spartans were scrupulous about their religious um, uh, obligations. So eventually the Athenians have to decide to attack, even without Spartan aid. So here we see Athens itself, the Bay of Marathon and Marathon, where the battle will occur about 25 miles away. This is the Bay of Marathon, and we have here the Persian ships along the coast, images of the Persian ships. Um, and then we get uh, these uh, funny little diagrams of what the, the disposition of troops might have been like. These are the Persians here in red, the Greeks in blue. In fact, we don't know which direction uh, the troops were facing at Marathon. This is a different uh, orientation with the Greeks here in blue and the Persians in red. Um, the key element here in our account by Herodotus is that the uh, Greek line was very thin in the center. And the reason the Athenian line was so thin in the center was the Athenians simply didn't have enough people to stand up against the vast Persian army here. So they tried to lengthen their line as long as they could make it, and this led to this thinner uh, center. Why the Athenians decide to attack on the day they did is something of a mystery. There's one clue we have in a late ancient source that talks about the cavalry being away. So the idea is that the Persians had actually re-embarked or were trying to re-embark their cavalry onto their warships. And that the Athenians, when they saw the Persians, had lost their advantage of cavalry, because the Athenians had no appreciable cavalry here, that the Athenians decided this was their best chance to attack, and they chose to attack while the Persian horses were either on ships or were being placed on ships. That's a good guess. Now, the battle itself is famous for a couple of other reasons, and one is that Herodotus tells us that the Athenians ran the last mile in the attack. They attacked the Persians on the run. Now, considering the Athenian hoplites were wearing 30 or 40 pounds of bronze armor and carrying a very heavy shield, it's highly unlikely that they ran for a whole a mile, <laughs> unless they're in way better shape than I am, um, before they attacked the Persians. 
But the run, the attack on a run is believable. And the reason it's believable is because the main uh, offensive power the Persians had was in their archery. And the Persians would have used bows that had a killing range of as much as 150 or 200 yards, which means that as soon as the Athenians get within 200 yards of the Persians, they're in range of Persian archers. So the reason to run that last 150 or 200 yards is to get out from under that archery as fast as you possibly can. So I do believe that the Athenians attacked the uh, um, Persians on the run. I think they did that to avoid as much archery fire as they could. And once they then came to grips with the Persians, it became clear very quickly that the Persian infantryman was inferior to the Greek. And one of the reasons for that is that Persian infantrymen were lightly armed. They didn't have bronze uh, breastplates. They weren't carrying heavy uh, uh, shields. They didn't have heavy metal uh, uh, helmets in most cases. So the individual Greek infantrymen in a unit like this were clearly uh, more than a match for Persian infantry. But I think we've got to be fair to say there was some luck involved here, too, <laughs> as there often is. You know, sometimes a quarterback decide, or the coach decides to throw a pass on the one-yard line. Um, and I think that uh, – yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, we, we, we can't, uh, um, well, one of the things, one of the ancient historians says to us is that war, least of all things proceeds according to established expectations. And that's certainly the case here at the battle of Marathon. The Persians were able to break through the weak center of the Athenian line, but in doing so, the Athenian right and left were able to swing around and to surround the Persians. Now, most uh, military experts will tell you, don't surround a larger force with a smaller force. That's a bad uh, plan. But in this case, the heavy Athenian infantrymen were able to do major damage to the Persians. And um, Herodotus' account tells us that only 192 Athenians died at Marathon, and 6,400 Persians were killed at Marathon. Um, the, the Persians who weren't killed were hightailing it back to their ships, as quickly as possible. Um, and then they got in their ships and they began to, to sail around Attica to Athens itself. Uh, this is a topographic map just showing you how flat the area here where the battle is actually fought, the coast where the ships were, and then the mountains that separate Marathon from the rest of Attica itself. This is the burial mound where we believe that the 192 Athenians were uh, buried um, uh, after the battle. So if we think of now the Persians up here on their ships, they decided to sail around Attica and over to the fortified city of Athens to take Athens before the Athenians could get back to protect it. Now, here, this is what I would call the real marathon. If you want to know what the marathon race's origins are, or ought to have been, the real marathon race was that these Athenian warriors, who had just fought a battle against the massive Persian em Empire, now had to get back to Athens. 25 or 6 miles in their 30 or 40 pounds of bronze, after having fought a battle, many of them are going to have been injured. But they managed to do it. They got back to Athens before the Persians were able to sail around. And so when the Persians show up here off the coast of Athens, they find that the Athenian military has beat them back. And so at this point, the Persians decide to go back to Persia. Now, the marathon race itself is often associated not with this run of the Athenian warriors, but with the supposed run of the messenger Pheidippides. A late source tells us that the Athenians sent a messenger back to Athens after the Battle of Marathon to tell the Athenians that Athens had won and that this person's name was Pheidippides. But that's not the best uh, account of what happened. The best account of what happened is Herodotus' account, which is almost a contemporary account. And Herodotus says Pheidippides is the man who was sent to Sparta. So here's Athens, here's Marathon, and about 125 miles away is Sparta. So Pheidippides was most likely sent to Sparta, not to Athens. Um, and he was probably sent from Marathon, by the way, but he might have been sent from Athens. Um, and, of course, this is the kind of story that nobody believed for a long time. But we know now, because of these crazy super marathoner guys who go out and run 120 miles <laughs> or more, 
that this is possible. Uh, human beings can do this. And in fact, if you look at our ancient sources carefully, you find these runners appear from time to time in the ancient sources. This was the easiest way to get a message a long way fast, was to send a runner like Pheidippides, who ran all the way to Sparta. Uh, 